What's up, y'all? So in this video, we're going to be going over two concepts. Number one, resource allocation. And number two, uh, the different economic systems. Why did the student eat his homework? Because the teacher told him it was a piece of cake. <laughs> Resource allocation. So in our previous videos, we talked about this concept of scarcity and how integral this concept of scarcity is to understanding economics. And so now we're going to add on to our, to our understanding of scarcity here. And so remember, scarcity is just the idea that we have unlimited wants, but limited resources to get those wants. And so what we're going to be talking about today is because of scarcity, how does society decide how to distribute or how to allocate their scarce resources? And so before we actually get into just sort of how they do it, we first have to talk about the three economic questions that every society has to answer. So here we have these three economic questions right here. Number one, what goods and services should be produced? Number two, how should these goods be produced? And number three, who consumes these goods and services? And basically, how a country or how society answers these economic questions determines their economic system. And here, right, is the definition for an economic system. And so now that we know the three different sort of economic questions, let's go into the three different economic systems. So the first one is going to be a command economy. And a, a command economy is otherwise known as communism, right? And so we're gonna use red for communism here. And so here, what makes this unique is that the answer to all three economic questions, right? What should, what should be produced? How should they be produced and who consumes it? Well, the government, A, owns all the resources and the government answers three economic questions. And so here, it's pretty simple. The government does everything. And so in theory, this is a very good thing, right? In theory, communism works, right? There's low unemployment, right? So there's a lot of happy people. Right? There's great job security. Governments tend not to go out of business, right? There's less income inequality. But there's a reason why we don't see a lot of communist nations or communistic nations in the world. And so here, in practice, communism doesn't work. Why? Well, because there's no incentive to work harder. If the government controls every single aspect of the economy, that means they also control wage. And so it doesn't matter how hard you work, you're going to earn the same amount as the person doing the least amount of work. And so that means, right, that there really is no incentive to work harder here. But then there's also no incentive to innovate or come up with good ideas. Why? Well, because the government controls everything. And so if the government controls everything, right, that means there's no room for individual thought. And if the government is the one de uh, determining everything, there is no competition. And if there's no competition, that means there's no incentive, right, to increase the quality of goods and to keep the prices low. So this economic system, right, communism or the command economy, it's great in theory, but it's not that great in reality. It's not that great in practice. Our second economic system is going to be the free market system, or what we're going to be calling capitalism. And so the first thing that we have to know is this idea of laissez-faire. So laissez-faire just means hands off. In other words, the government is going to stay hands off of the economy. They're not going to get involved. And so if we're looking back at our three economic questions, well, it's going to be the individuals, right? The individuals own the resources. The individuals answer the three economic questions. And that's important because it allows for people to make profit, to make money. And if you give the incentive to individuals to make money, well, that means they, they have the incentive or they need to increase the product quality and produce these items efficiently. Why? Well, because if they didn't do that, then they're going to go out of business and they're not going to make any money whatsoever. So here, at the end of the day, what the free market system allows for, it allows for goods to be cheap and it keeps the quality of those goods up. And so here, if the government stays 
hands off, if the government practices a laissez-faire style of policy in this free market system, well, how does the free market regulate itself? Well, here's an example. So let's say, right, we have consumers and they say we want phones or smartphone, right, because we're in the 21st century. But there's only one company that makes them. Well, now there is an incentive for other companies to enter into the smartphone market to start producing smartphones. Why? Well, because they know if there's a, there's a want, if they enter it and fulfill these people's wants, they're going to make a profit. And so this leads to more business entering into the smartphone market, which then leads to more competition, which eventually leads to lower prices, better quality, and more product variety. And so why does this matter? Well, here we're looking at this end result now. What the free market system allows for is it allows for the most efficient production of goods and it allows for the production of goods that consumers want at the highest possible quality and at relatively the lowest possible price. And so here, right, here's an example why communism failed just on the flip side. You guys can read this throughout your own time. But here, now we're going back to this idea of the invisible hand, which is a lot like laissez-faire. So if laissez-faire just means hands off, the government is not going to get involved. The invisible hand is saying the government doesn't need to get involved because the market is always going to fix itself. And so one of the problems that a market may have is going to be a shortage of goods. In other words, there's not enough supply to keep up with the demand. And so the invisible hand, right, is going to say to fix a shortage, right, companies are going to produce more and that fixes the shortage. So there is no need for the government to get involved here. The last economic system is a mixed economy. And so what makes this unique is that a majority, if not all the countries in the world, has a form of a mixed economy. And so the characteristics of it is just a combination of communism or command economy and the free market, right? There is no truly, there is not a truly free market economic system in the world today, right? If we're going to call something a free market economy, it's more than likely going to be a mixed economy here, right? So in other words, the, it, sometimes the individual answers the three economic questions. Other times, the government answers the three economic questions, right? The last thing that we're going to talk about is productivity. And then we're going to say productivity creates wealth. And what I mean by that is productivity, we can also say is this word efficient. And so we're going to say the more efficient you are, the more money that company or the country is going to make, which should make sense, right? And so we are going to say, looking at these three economic systems, the command economy, the free market, and the mixed economy, is that countries with free markets, and then we can also say here country, oops, uh, countries with mixed markets, right? Because it's, it's just a type of free market here that have property rights and the rule of law, they historically have greater economic growth. Why? Well, because they're more efficient. They are more productive than countries that have a command economy or practice communism. All right, so that's our video for today. I hope you guys learned a lot, and I'll see you guys in the next video. Peace.